Matthew Holt. I'm the uh, publisher, founder, uh, author at the Healthcare blog, and thrilled to be here on this uh, Health Impact session. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, uh, the friction that lives in the world of onboarding and working uh, in uh, hospitals for nursing staff, um, and have a great lineup to uh, talk with you about that. So uh, I have with me today, uh, Vicky Diasi. She is the strategic director for digital health and a bunch of other stuff and a nurse informaticist at the University of Utah. Uh, Scott Raymond, who's the chief information and innovation officer at Nebraska Medicine and also a pediatric nurse. And Rob Seabar, who is the healthcare identity strategist at SailPoint, a consulting company, but previously was at uh, Centene, the large government-based managed care company. So welcome to all of you. We're gonna dive in uh, eventually to looking at some uh, technology solutions for onboarding, reducing friction, and sort of making the, the workplace workplace and work life better for uh, for nursing and other stuff in the hospital. But I want to start off with uh, everyone has been through just a hell of a two to three years, uh, especially those of you working with, working in and working with people at the uh, at the leading edge of, you know, dealing with COVID. We're only now literally just coming up to three years of, of what's been an extraordinary time uh, especially inside the four walls of the hospital, but for everybody in healthcare. So, um, and uh, I've noticed that all of you recently, recently le left your previous jobs and are doing something different. So I don't know, uh, Vicky, I know you moved to Salt Lake City for the skiing, but uh, you were a New York president before, before. Why don't we start with you and just give, give me a quick flavor of what the last two to three years has been like for you and what the challenges you've seen have been. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And and yes, yeah, spending the last few years in New York City, you know, certainly was difficult on many levels. Uh, but certainly, the most difficult part for me as a nurse was just seeing the impact um, on our frontline staff uh, and our leadership as well. You know, I think one of the things that you know, I've thought a lot about um, reflecting back on the time is that, you know, flexibility is critical. And I think that, you know, think moving forward, preparing for flexibility and ensure, ensuring we have that in our health system is going to be very important. Um, and I think about that from travel nursing to virtual nursing, um, you name it. Uh, so, uh, excited to talk about uh, some of the specifics here today, um, and specific specifically that flexibility around our technology as well. Yeah, we'll definitely get into the the nursing crisis because it still is a crisis. And I, I saw a, a, some data today that um, we're we're short one hundred thousand nurses under the age of forty five, something like that. So uh, you probably have better data than, than me on that. Um, Scott, uh, talk about talk about nursing. You you said before we came on board that you're you you haven't touched a patient in a while, but you still keep your license up. Can you talk a little about what? And you've also recently moved in the last few years. So tell me a little bit about what your uh, experience has been the last two to three years. Yeah, I think the pandemic changed a lot of things, uh, both from a frontline clinician. Uh, and provider perspective, but also from the support needed uh, to support clinicians and patients. So uh, when the pandemic started, I had to move rapidly 500 IT folks from on-prem to remote uh, and what that looked like. Fortunately, we were kind of prepared because we had already had implemented flexible work, um, not only from a, a, a shift perspective, but also two days from working from home. So most of my 500 folks already had laptops, already had uh, things to support uh, the organization uh, during the pandemic. So I, I managed the first wave, managed moving people off, but I think it changed the way we do clinical care. And even that, some of that is held over today. So I think Vicki mentioned, you know, telenursing, telehealth, that changed not only from the pandemic perspective, uh, inside the four walls, we were using telehealth to reduce PPE and reduce the number of staff having to be exposed to kind of reduce that, that friction as well. And also to provide the ability to have family members reach out to their loved ones that were not gonna be able to be visited or weren't gonna come home, right? Um, and I think it's carried over. So a lot of folks are transitioning back but the impact on nursing remains, and I think you mentioned the nursing shortage, we're having a hard time staffing uh, the hospital without travelers, and that's created a, a, an impact on the organization as a whole. And not only 
the nurses themselves, the staff nurses, but I think we're going to talk a little bit about nursing management and what it, it did to that. But I think the pandemic has changed us forever, um, but we are kind of moving back uh, to some semblance of normal and moving some IT folks back in to support clinicians because clinicians on the front line didn't get to see some of their partners uh, in other parts of the organization for a long time. So reintroducing and starting to provide uh, that support at kind of the elbow uh, is, a, is a change for a lot of organizations, including ours. Yeah, meet, meet, meeting, meeting your friends and colleagues, sometimes for the first time, you know. Um, uh, and, and before I, uh, Rob, I want to go to you in a second. Before I go there, Vicky uh, and Scott, one of the things that's that's happened a lot, obviously, in the in the in the sort of the venture world that we see and in the sort of digital health uh, companies, is there's been a tremendous amount of capital thrown at essentially nurse new types of nurse staffing agencies. I can think of four or five off the top of my head that have raised you know more than two hundred million dollars each. Obviously, you mentioned travel nursing, remote nursing, and all the rest of it. How how much do you think that that aspect of sort of nurse management, of staff management, has changed, and how much are these new companies, you know, playing a role? And 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 Scott, you mentioned travel nurses. We've had lots of uh, stories about travel nurses, even in the same state or the same city, sort of you know moving across town for a lot higher pay and jealousy and workplace issues because of that happening. So can you give me a flavor between the two of you and your organizations of how this new way of sort of nurse recruiting, nurse management, even before we talk about what happens when they get onto the floor, how that's playing out? You want to start, Vicki, or you want me to go? Sure, sure. I'll start. I think there are a couple of things there. So I think, you know, one, having these new staffing agencies and you know, models, if you will, I think is important because we realize something has to change. I think that's one thing that um, has become apparent. And I would say, unfortunately, a lot of what we're seeing across nursing are organizations trying to revert back to old models of staffing. And so I don't think we fully made the transition yet. So I think this is an important time to pause and understand what we've learned um, over the past couple of years and how we need to pivot in order to move forward. Um, I think having uh, some sort of uh, gig uh, nursing economy is going to be important, and I don't think it's clear as to what that looks like yet. I briefly mentioned virtual nursing, and there are quite a number of organizations moving in that direction. So I think understanding how we can use um, uh, or transition staff into that virtual nursing role is going to be important to understand as well. So uh, I don't know, from my perspective, I think the verdict is still out as to how we're going to move forward. Scott? Yeah, I would agree with Vicki completely. I think there's there's some very fortunate things that happen with staffing agencies for the ability to staff and to augment staff, especially during the height of the pandemic. I think the end result, though, is a difficult um, proposition for organizations to manage now because the cost of travel nurses is, is tremendous. It's three to four X of a staff nurse. Um, and so that's putting economic pressure on a lot of organizations across the country. And it's kind of, I think, Vicki hit it right. It's, it's a gig economy of nursing and younger nurses, a lot of nurses out of school want the ability to travel, don't want to be stuck in one location. Uh, they don't, they're usually healthier and younger, so they don't need access to some of the benefits of an organization. So I think a lot of organizations are struggling on how do we have that as a component, um, but also how do we recruit nurses back uh, into staff positions, uh, not only to reduce the cost, but to reduce continuity of care. So, you know, some, Organizations have floors that have 80% of their nursing is outsourced to travelers and only 20% are staff nurses. That's pretty difficult from a nurse manager perspective to manage, especially as those folks cycle in and out on 12 or 13 week contracts. And so a lot of those staff nurses are seeing new faces a lot. And, and a lot of the staffing or a lot of the travel nurses don't have an investment in the organization as a whole. So that creates a challenge. And then I agree with Vicki that it's like I'm old enough and been a nurse uh, long enough where I trained 
in team nursing, I trained on a paper chart. Uh, and now, you know, the transition electronic chart, the transition to primary care nursing and BSN led primary care nursing. And now organizations looking at how do we reintroduce travel nurses? The only problem with that is, and Vicki, I'm sure you guys see this, there's not a whole lot of certified nursing assistants and there's not a whole lot of LVN or LPMs to create a team nurse. So um, that that challenge or that nursing shortage goes across as well. So uh, how we do care redesign is gonna be really important. And I do think technology is gonna play a role. I think telesitting, telenursing, how do we manage um, subacute care? How do we manage folks uh, kind of more in a, a cohesive way and reducing the burden of having, you know, the staff ratios uh, or patient to staff ratios uh, consistent. So I think there's a huge challenge and I think we're all looking at it uh, in the same vein, but maybe a little bit different depending on your demographic. So the shortage is less on the East Coast and West Coast. And you can imagine in the in the flyover states or in the Midwest, it's it's different. So. All right. Um, would you, I mean, real quick, would you say the the, the new flavor of uh, sort of nurse uh, nurse hiring communities, you know, the ones that have been like Shift and Incredible Health have been raising all this money? Any, you know, is there a noticeable difference in the way you manage nursing using these organizations versus the old line staff agencies, or is it pretty much the same underlying problems? Well, I think that's the that's the trick, and and Scott alluded to this this. Um, the challenge uh, with travel nursing, um, I would argue we have to, you know, look at it a little differently and that perhaps we need to rethink the way we uh, staff nurses and manage nurses. Um, I think we saw in New York City that we were, you know, we're, we easily adapted to bringing in staff nurses and you know, ensuring they had the technology that they needed, um, putting in processes to quickly onboard them. So I think it's really thinking differently about how we onboard staff and how we manage, uh, you know, staff nurses, travel nurses, virtual nurses, all of the above. All right. Rob, probably a good moment to bring you in here. Um, you've been working for you, you, you're the you and me are the two token non-nurses on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 though are an expert, so you have to know something unlike me. Um, so uh, uh you know, you you worked for many years at a, at a at a major health plan on the health web services side within the side. Now you're working in, in particularly in identity management and uh and multifactorial authentication. Um in a world like this, right, where things are changing so quickly for nursing organizations. How do you, uh, you know, um, what kind of things are you seeing now that you didn't used to see that, you know, that, that, that are different for, for organizations delivering healthcare? Sure. Um, so, look, all of the points are valid. One one thing that Scott and Vicki and, and every other, candidly, every other health system globally has at this point is, is we've, we now have this kind of hybrid work model that is completely new to anything that existed before, right? So, like Scott had said, I believe 500 people or so had to move over uh, overnight. We we actually, believe it or not, we moved about 40,000 people over to remote uh, in the span of like three days, right? I mean, it's a it, the, the stress on technology is pretty crazy. But then you think about the hybrid roles uh, that clinicians have been forced into. You think about uh, all your security policies and things that you you know you control your four walls and the things that you need to do to ensure you're safe to operate. And you've just blown those up, right? We've said, well, we got to stretch this here and allow this access, and we don't have enough people, so we got to, uh, you know, have multiple people do, you know, more than one thing. And so, what's become very, very common across health systems is this concept of multiple roles per single identity. So you're one mortal user, but you're asked to be in this facility two days a week, and another facility three days a week, volunteering on weekends, and a student by night, and whatever it might be. All of this then compounds a job like Scott's <laughs> because you've got to find a way to allow people to work. You don't want to frustrate people so that they leave. We've just talked about how difficult it is to, um, you know, to retain people and find people and, and whatever. Um, so you have to do all of this in a way that enables people to work, but doesn't uh, make you vulnerable, right? So that this is this has just exploded over the last few years. So before we, we we will dive into you know some of the the, the specifics and technologies around that 
in a little bit uh, to, in the middle of the, the end of this seg segment. Before we get in there, there's a whole piece that we haven't really talked about, which is what does this mean for leadership? And, uh, you know, we could probably have an entire conference on <laughs> what what's the change in leadership and how, how are you managing these organizations now that it's no longer just inpatient versus outpatient or what have you. But, but um, Vicky, what are the kind of bigger problems and and theories of leadership that you know you've seen bubbling up both in new york and now in uh, in utah um you know how has this changed the way you think about you know what is the job of a senior nurse leader such as yourself yeah absolutely it's it's certainly changed so i think as as rob alluded to this idea of nurses with multiple roles and i think we saw that um, you know, throughout the past couple of years, uh, nurse leaders being asked to step into um, new roles and responsibilities that they may have not had in the past or may have not done in a long time. Um, and I would say, you know, the hard part for uh, nursing leaders is that there has been um you know, a real difficulty in managing the polarity of protecting and preserving your staff, and then also being able to respond to the demands of, you know, upper level management. And I think, unfortunately, what we've seen is a real shortage in nurse managers. So we've seen a lot of nurse managers leave. And then we've also seen a lot of nurse managers, uh, you know, step into that role uh, without a ton of experience. So we have a lot of new nurse managers trying to navigate this environment. And that's everything from, you know, the placement of staff. So I think anything that we can do on the technology front to support that piece, how can we, um, you know, leverage technology in a way that makes it easier uh, for nurse managers to assign the appropriate staff to the appropriate roles, appropriate floors, et cetera. So again, helping out with that that flexibility and moving staff as needed. Um, and then and then also the provisioning of new uh, staff members coming on board. Uh, so I think that has been challenging for nurse leaders. Uh, you know, there are some, you know, units that that I encountered where the most experienced nurse um, had been there for just two years uh, because of the amount of uh, staff turnover. Um, so I think that's especially challenging um, on the education front, especially when we're looking at some of the EHR training concerns. So I think there's just a lot more on the plate of nurse managers who I said are, you know, very new to their roles and, you know, are in need of as much support as possible. Scott, you uh, you alluded to this a little bit. Obviously, there was the, the you know, same question, but with a slightly different flavor. You've got the, uh, you, you've got the issue of, of supporting with an IT organization that's got to support all these different changes in the nursing environment. Um, there's issues there, and you've got to lead your own IT organization. And of course, it hasn't been a stationary three years for, the IT world, <laughs> huge suck up from the tech world at the start of the process and probably a huge vomiting out of talent from the tech world now. So I don't know if that's impacting, uh, you know, you, you, you're all on that. You're obviously probably negotiating a more distributed team than you were. How, how do you think about, you know, leadership of an IT part of a healthcare organization? Yeah, I think it's, it's similar challenges, uh, a little bit different. There's, um, you know, you can use managed services to take over some of the functions like you could use um, travel nurses to take over some functions. I think just like nursing, it's really recruitment, retention and engagement. And how can you do that effectively to keep your staff engaged? For From my perspective, most of my staff continue to be remote. And so how do you engage not only your leadership team, but how, to, how do you give them tools to engage folks when they're not in the office nine to five uh, and how do you create a culture and an environment where those folks that are now outside of the hospital or not in a building adjacent, how do you keep them tied to the, the end of their keyboard all the way down to the patient care that's being given by clinicians? So how do you make that connection from a culture perspective? And I think that's been a challenge. And then just from our nursing leaders, the feedback or the comments that Vicki made are really true. So how do you manage a budget uh, when you're using uh, contract labor that's so expensive, how do you keep your nurses engaged? How do you keep them uh, 
to stay. So stay interviews, recruitment, enhancing nurses that left the organization to come back. What incentives can you provide uh, that other organizations aren't providing? And what stability or what benefits can you provide that the that the staffing agencies aren't providing? So um, I think a lot of parallels with you know how you manage folks, um, both with nursing and IT, but more importantly for me, how do I bring my folks that are outside of the organization now back in and and connect them to the the care that's being given on the floors. Um, and it's, you know, the burnout on both sides is real because COVID made nurses work 24 seven and a lot of extra shifts and IT folks, uh, including IT managers have been working really 24 seven on Zoom. You know, I remember when we first transitioned to Zoom, our first managers meeting, I got on at seven in the morning. I didn't get off till 6.30 at night. And, you know, I didn't, I wasn't comparing us to nurses who were, you know, living the pandemic and, and those pressures. And, but you just are never off. Um, and so how do you manage that both from a nursing perspective and, a, and an IT perspective? Yeah, Zoom and real fatigue is, is real in both cases. Um, Rob, so you know, we, we I, I heard a lot of questions from Scott there. Do you have a? Do you, what are the kind of the answers to some of those? How how is some of the work that you've been doing, you know, uh, around identity management and uh, general uh, general tech services helping um, answer some of those questions? Yeah, look, um, it's easy to fall to the conversation of, oh, you have to be secure and you got to follow policy and you got to do X, Y, and Z. I'm a big believer that. Um, if you're managing identity right, and, and by identity, I mean the flow of a user accessing the things that they need at the right time to provide the right care, et cetera, right? If you're managing it properly, you're, you're going to be secure as a byproduct, right? Mm -hmm. This is really, it's, it, it's so much of an end user component than it is a security or as much as it is a, as a security component, right? You're really looking at how do I build roles, right? Uh, collections of access that I can provide somebody on day one so that somebody who took a risk in leaving their organization and joining mine can start their training day one, can enroll in benefits day one, can start their career day one and not wait on the, you know, potentially manual efforts to provision access and provision services and equipment it's it's it goes back to you know all these all these pressures in IT to certainly exist all these pressures at the at the patient bedside exist. We as IT professionals have to get better at finding ways to leverage technology to enable those efficiencies, right? And that will reduce the burden and friction on clinicians at the bedside, right? I mean, it, it's end of day. I mean, in some cases, we are talking life or death in this industry, right? So what, what are the practical things around sort of, you talk about easy onboarding, easy identity, identity managing, management. We mentioned multiple roles with one identity. What are some of the practical tools that you're seeing being adopted? And then perhaps we can go to Vicky and Scott and figure out you know, how that's working where they are. <laughs> you're looking yeah. across the industry and they're obviously deep, deep dive in, a, in, in one place or a couple places. Yeah, absolutely. So um, look, we... You, you start with, you consider your populations, right? Whether you're talking employed physicians, contracted physicians, students, right? Know where they are and know how they're governed, right? How do you know? What's the event that says, oh, we've got a new hire or, oh, somebody terminated out, like security professional, put your hat on. You don't want terminated uh, users to have active accounts, right? I mean, that's a, that's a security problem, right? Um, so know your populations. And then in terms of making things easier, Look at your roles, integrate your clinicals. Think about how you provision access into your uh, clinical systems, your, your EHRs. Think about how that day one user experience should be holistic, should be, I've joined, I've got my equipment if I need it, I've got my access if I need it, et cetera. Um, and then the other kind of things that kind of play along with that are, think about uh, you know things like single sign-on. You, know, you want to be able to SSO into things. You want you know, to, to access things with, logging in one time, you know, it's asking users to manage, um, you know, multiple credentials and multiple things gets really challenging. Um, the other thing that we're seeing a lot of, and I don't know if either of you are impacted by it, we see a ton more merger and acquisition in healthcare these days. 
And now you have these problems where user in you know, system A needs access to application in system B. How do you facilitate that if you haven't provided a trust between those networks, right? There's, there's technology and capability relative to identity that can support that workflow that helps enable business to accelerate. It helps enable those integrations to accelerate. But at the end of the day, it helps enable those clinicians to do their job. Vicky, Scott, how, uh, perhaps I'll pick on you first, Scott. Um, Rob said a lot of great stuff, a lot of solutions there, which sound like they can work for all those problems. Uh, I guess two questions. First is, how much do you think about that set of problems amongst all the other technology problems you have to think about for nursing? And then secondly, how, how easily apparent, uh, how, how easily available and apparent have those solutions been? Or are we kind of stuck, like we often are in health call, health, healthcare, way behind the eight ball? Yeah, I know Rob and I could geek out for hours on this subject. Um, and I agree with a lot of things he says. So let's just let's just hit uh, identity uh, management and access management. Uh, so having a single system to onboard and offboard people easily um, and securely. And importantly, how do you give access to folks to the things they need immediately? So Rob alluded to that. So so role-based access is key. Um, and I know Vicky's probably going to squint at me or wink at me, but with those nurses that are on, that do cross multiple um, departments and may have access, different access, having an access management system, you can manage that pretty easily. Um, and then I look, we talked about a little bit, we've, you know, in our pre-meetings together, this idea of, of dual authentication inside and outside. So Rob hit on it. So tap badging with single sign-on, using virtualized desktops, uh, using a virtualized environment to give a certain amount of access. So I can tap in in the morning, authenticate myself, and I can provision that access for the amount of time. So maybe give four hours before you have to re-authenticate uh, or in some areas less or more. Um, and having that management and being able to take that authenticated workspace, uh, including Epic, with you to the next workstation, super important. And that can take away that friction. And if you just look at, at the ER, the amount of times a physician and nurse log into different workstations to take care of the, you know, revolving patients in that environment, having that ability to do that uh, really increases the um the satisfaction with the tools, even though you know most clinicians uh, are still burdened with documentation. Uh, so at least if I can take away the burden of access and take away um, the burden of control from the IT folks and the security folks uh, by having a management system for access and identity, I think is is key. And again, Rob and I, we could we could talk about this probably for three hours. So so in that. In that world, what, what would you give your, I mean, you've been to a number of organizations and, and Vicky, same for you. Uh, how, how would you market? I mean, is this something a problem that we've licked now or is this a problem which the industry is just getting to grips with and how are your organizations doing? Have you know, you, have, are, you, are you happy where you are in that situation or does, do you have more work to do? Uh, Vicky, you, first, Scott, you, to, you go first. <laughs> uh, Vicky, okay, he's done this on you, Vicky. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I, I am happy with, with where it is. Um, but I, I do want to make a few more comments, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Scott respond unless he's going to skirt the Go question. Go on forever. No, I won't. No. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think depending on what organization you're at and their IT maturity depends on whether they're behind the eight ball or on the, on the front. I think a lot of organizations from, uh, an access perspective and a tap badging perspective. I think a lot of healthcare uh, institutions have adopted that and are leveraging that uh, to take away that access friction, at least. And I also just wanted to circle back to, to Rob's comment around access and patient safety and patient care, um, and also connect this to our travel nursing discussion. So um, this happened in a number of places. I think California is where we saw it in the press the most. But uh, if travel nurses are not getting the access to the systems that they need, they will quit, right? So they come on and they're not getting the access, not being provisioned appropriately, they're gone, right? And that is, that is something that I think uh, will continue to happen in terms of travel nurses uh, being onboarded to new organizations. I don't think we've seen the end of it. 
Um, so making sure that access is available um, during that onboarding is key uh, because then that only delays and causes more issues with getting the workforce that's needed. And I think in terms of what organizations can do, you know, I really see two paths that that took place over the last couple of years. You can either actually design your device programs for travel nurses. So when they come on board, that they have a device that they can use, you know, that is secure for that organization, you know, or you maintain the same security protocols that you have for your current staff, which is that, you know, two-factor two authentication, your you know, password uh, protections, et cetera. Um, so I think that's important for organizations to think about and not cut corners in those areas. Make sure that you um, have a very clear strategy and then that onboarding is um, working properly so that you're not losing the new nurses that you are bringing on board. I would, um, I would layer that just one level deeper too. And that look, getting into the workstation and getting into the applications that that authentication piece is critical, right? Then there's that, what am I actually authorized to do now that I'm in there? And more of the nuance exists for clinicians in that authorization layer. Do I have the right entitlements to do what I need to do? And, and oftentimes it means it's, it's no, I don't. So I have to open a service request and that request sits in a queue, waits for a human being to do something and that cycle of time can be quite ridiculous in certain scenarios, right? So, so Rob, I was going to ask you about that, that that same scenario, but just for the onboarding part, right? Are we, wait, are we waiting on some other department, some other human, human resources system or something else to get that individual travel nurse or whoever that new person is onto the system? I mean, Vicky said they don't get access, they, they, they quit. I mean, is that something that sits in a, can, can sit in a queue for days? And how do we automate that away so that that power gets given to whoever the hiring manager is or whoever's responsible. Yeah, it, it's a super common problem, right? And, and some organizations, look, if you're only hiring 20 people a week, you probably do that manually, right? But if you're hiring 200 a week, that's a little harder, you know? And if you have multiple facilities and whatever it might be, it, healthcare has these you know, nuances, right? But yes, exactly. You can have a manual queue for uh, getting your AD account created, a manual queue for getting a laptop provisioned or, or you know, a thin client or whatever it is you need manual queue for X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and look, there's a lot of orchestration in placing that you can use IT service management platforms to orchestrate the routing of those tickets. So it's more efficient to deliver, but there's also capabilities that allow you to automatically provision and deprovision those types of access and automatically create AD accounts, automatically generate emails, automatically get people assigned to a role and working again, day one, back to that user experience piece. Yeah, I agree with you, Rob. I think the I think the role based if you if you're sophisticated in your organization and you've really honed in on role based access, you can onboard people pretty rapidly. Um, and if you have, like Vicky talked about, nurses that have multiple roles, you can layer on different roles in that access. So at day one, they have access to the the tools they need. And I can't agree with you more. Automating the onboarding from signing the application through your first day of orientation, super important to, especially to your point, if you're hiring hundreds of people a week or thousands of people a year, you can't afford to have manual processes anymore. It just doesn't work. So one one quick question is we've all, we've all seen this, you know, the, uh, the, the password written on the sticky note and handed around or not, the one identity handed around to multiple people or the, the single, you know, the, the sign or the or device that gets that's supposed to be signed to one person that gets passed around. Uh, where do you think we are in terms of you know under, the the cultural understanding of that level of security over over the last couple of years, especially with all these new people coming in? I honestly have not seen an issue with that, at least right. amongst nurses, and I think that also comes down to the device strategy, right? So I think. Mm -hmm for nurses that have their own devices they they already have their method of of knowing how to log on and you know not sharing desktops so i think you know fortunately being in an organization that has a mobile device strategy for nurses um i don't think it's as prevalent but perhaps in organizations where they are still relying on desktops that might be very different so a problem that's been solved question mark 
Uh, yes and no. I think it depends on the sophistication. So, um, you know, if you have sophisticated passwords that expire every 90 days, uh, if you don't have self-service deployed to reset your password without having to get a hold of the service desk, I think you're going to you're going to struggle, especially around the physicians. And I also think, you know, being able to tap badge in uh, kind of smooths that out. But I think Vicky's point is well taken. People understand uh, security. They understand, you know, they their lives have been electronified, so they have you know sign-ons for banking, sign-on for almost everything that they manage, uh, and phishing and stealing of credentials is is not something hidden in the background. Everybody kind of knows about it now. So I think as long as you're thoughtful about uh, the access and you provide that self-service, um, it's not that big of an issue. Well, I totally agree, actually. And I, and I love the point because I think we are getting more security aware, right? Even my kids, you know, amaze me sometimes, you know. Um, that said, I think some of the challenges we see in health systems are, and I realize the numbers are changing, but there's some really long timers in the organizations, right? People move around, they get, they take new roles, they they move away from one thing to a different thing, but they retain that access along the way. And then inevitably somebody joins and says, well, I want new nurse Susie to look like nurse Sally. <laughs> and all of a sudden Susie has this 12 years of access <laughs> that she shouldn't have. You know, it's really, if you're, if you're creating roles accordingly and you're assigning them accordingly, you know, via, you know, a, a department ID or a job code or whatever you're using, um, Susie looks like Sally in the right that, she can do everything Sally needs to do relative to that job. Do you, you see what I mean? Yeah, that role base is super important. I agree with you. Is the eventual evolution of this that everybody sort of manages this themselves with their own with their own devices and somehow this has there's a central outsource function for each organization that sort of gives people different roles as they go in and out? Given that given the Vicky, you were saying right at the start that we're not going to go back to the old world of you know the same nurse being there for 20 years. Um, people are floating around, people are going to inpatient and outpatient uh, much more. There's, there's obviously uh, organizations emerging uh, all the time. Um, and yet we still hear about cyber attacks and ransomware attacks, you know, happening all the time in healthcare. How do you think this ends up? I'll start with you, Vicky. Hmm. Uh, well, you know, yes, I do think there will be some sort of self-management and I'll take that opportunity here to promote uh, something which I think is very important, which is uh, the unique nurse identifier. So I think there's an interesting, um, you know, a piece to this, uh, this picture here in that, you know, for physicians, there is a, an NPI. So there is a way to identify a physician cross organizations. Um, for nurses, there isn't. And I think this is an opportunity to really think about, and you know, certainly um, nationally, we are uh, working to promote this um, from organization to organization, but really thinking about how we use the NCS, um, NCSBN, which is the national state board identifier that nurses get when they take their license. How can we use that so we know what a particular nurse is provisioned for from one organization to another organization. Um, so I think there, there's more work we can do in this area. And uh, I think that's one piece to this puzzle in thinking about how we can know what um, a nurse is, is trained and uh, you know, specialized in um, you know, across organizations and across states. Yeah. Uh, so Nurses need identifiers, doctors already have them. Let's not introduce the concept of patient identifiers because that would be another three hour <laughs> session, I know, plus several acts of Congress and revolution and God knows what else. Anyway, uh, Scott, where do you think this is going to sort of uh, come out? What is your role going to evolve to? And what is this particular aspect of it going to evolve to? Is it going to be taken away to somebody, to somebody else and be as a completely different managed service? Or how do you think this ends up? Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. I think you're looking into the, into the, crystal ball of the future a little bit there. I think Vicky hit a, a really nice point. Uh, having a national database of, you know, where there's some states that are, that if I have a nursing license in California, I can practice in Arizona. Um, and having a national number like a physician does, or call it a credentialing 
knowing what I have, what my specialty is and what I should be able to do. Um, I think we would have been able to avoid kind of that scandalous thing that happened with people buying a nursing school and get and taking the NCLEX and getting a license. So, um, but it would be interesting. That it's really thought provoking. I'd love to hear what Rob says about it, but from a, from a identity management and at least access or zero trust perspective, it'd be really interesting if we can identify people across organizations. I think the tricky thing is we don't have a universal EHR. So kind of access in Epic looks a little different than access in Cerner or in or in Meditech. So I think that that might pose a unique challenge, but I think from a credentialing perspective, that would be a great challenge for nursing to the BRNs to get together and assign me a number uh, that tells me what I've what I've certified in, what I can do, and what I can't do from a nursing practice perspective. Yeah, not to mention I just saw the Good Nurse, which is the movie came out last year about the the, the, the nurse transferred to hospital, hospital, hospital back in the late nineties, early two thousands, who uh, was killing all the patients because he was bored, <laughs> which probably not not something you want to encourage, but yeah, no, hard hard to find, right? Um, Way to end on a positive note there, man. Yeah, well, it was a good movie. Jessica <laughs> Chastain was great. Also, I was reminded that. Uh, she was still working away and hiding a heart condition because she didn't get automatic health insurance back then. That was only 2003, 2004. Times have changed for the better a little bit. Anyway, um, Rob, mm -hmm. bring us home here. How is this going to look in the future and uh, how can people find you to, to find out more about this? All right, great. Um, all very valid points. I think, um, look, we've got to get better at uh, understanding you know, our own identity. I've said, I've said for a long time that we all have a social security number as an example. Like a nine digit number doesn't scale forever, right? Like we've got to, figure out another method for proving who we are, how we're credentialed. I love the idea of some type of national identity provider to give me some type of information to vet against. But I will say as an organization, um, if, if Scott, you know, if I'm you, if I'm sitting as CIO of an organization, I, you know, it's your brand, right? At the end of the day, if you get breached, it's your brand that takes the hit. So you've got to have a way to correlate your identity context of what you know about people on your network to that you know, universal information and marry that correctly. And I think we're, we're you know, headed in the right direction for those things. So a company like SailPoint that I work for, um, look, we're an identity security uh, platform. You know, we're here to help with that type of thing. I will say, company aside, like it, it bothers me how excited I get to talk about this kind of stuff. So please reach out, I'm happy to, uh, it's, it's, it's fun. So this has been great, thank you. And how does someone find you, Rob? Um, I am uh, LinkedIn, I think will be shared. Uh, I, I'm not much for social media. So LinkedIn is as much as I have. And you are pretty good at hunting down on social <laughs> yeah, media. I know how to find my sales point, my sell point resources. So <laughs> now Rob, now Rob's one of them. So that's great. <laughs> Rob, Rob's to put himself there with anybody who cares about this problem, which is, which, you know, is I think everyone who's looking who's, who's involved in the running of a big healthcare organization these days and, and many others, because, uh, I know identity management overall the security audit is, is ramping up even some of the consult the companies i consult with in the sort of health it business and now doing things like sending me dedicated laptops so i don't have their stuff on my on my laptop which is a real pain in the ass if you're a consultant but i understand why and their audit staff are saying if you're going to handle data somewhere in your organization you know you can't have anybody in the organization who who, uh, who is you know going rogue in any way and these things these things are going to be uh, increasingly part of our lives and uh, yeah someone to want to tell me rob that that national identity number is going to be the phone number Everyone has one of those. Maybe, yeah. maybe that's it. But uh, those those change pretty often. I'd be terrified of that. Yeah. <laughs> there is there is the, maybe you just get assigned a phone number, a ten digit phone number at birth, and uh, you, at least you can now move those between. Unlike Cerner and Epic, at least you can move those between your phone companies now. Anyway, all right. Well, uh, it's been a really enlightening uh, discussion here about uh, the, the 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 perils and challenges of of uh, running organizations and nursing. Not to mention all that uh, security concerns and onboarding concerns. Uh, I want to thank uh, Scott Raymond uh, from uh, the, the CI, Chief Innovation and Information Officer at Nebraska Medicine, Vicky Diassi, who's the Strategic Director of Digital Health at the University of Utah, and Rob Seabor, who is the uh, Healthcare Identity Strategist at SailPoint. I'm Matthew Holt from the Healthcare Blog saying thanks for spending some time with us. Mm -hmm.